Fala galera, beleza? Bem-vindo a mais uma Taurian Podcast, estamos na nossa 17ª edição e hoje nós teremos um convidado que será feito em inglês a podcast hoje, mas antes disso eu gostaria de deixar aí para vocês um aviso que hoje nós estamos fazendo uma promoção com as luvas da Taurian MMA, as luvas de treino, nós temos aqui a T Ivory, entra no site taurianmma.com, vai na página de luvas de MMA e você pode adquirir essa luva com 15% de desconto com o promo code DEVEN. Eu vou deixar aqui na tela aqui para vocês. E vocês conseguem aí 15% de desconto. Mas não é só essa luva não. Você também tem essa daqui. A Team Phoenix. Vocês vão conseguir ela por 15% de desconto também. Alright, everybody. Thank you all for being here. My name is Yuri, the Immortal. Undefeated MMA Fighter. And um, today we're going to be doing a special... Uh, We're gonna, you can get those gloves right here, the T Ivory V2 and the T Phoenix for uh, with the uh, 15% off discount. Just go to uh, torimma.com, go to uh, the MMA gloves page, and then you put the promo code on and you get 15% off. The promo code is gonna be Devin. And today we have a special guest. This is gonna be the second time we do a podcast in English, as you guys can see. Um, my English is getting much better. Yeah, I'm practicing. Yes. Yeah. So, guys, I have, uh, we come a long way. We used to train together in Moncayo Brothers. He used to kick my ass. He can't do that anymore because I'm much better now. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, guys, today we have Mr. Devin Mo Motri. That's me. Motri. I got it right this time? You got it okay. right. It sounds like Motri. It sounds like a medicine. It does. Right. I'm a medicine. I put people to sleep. <laughs> Tell me about it. You gave me pain instead of taking away my pain, man. <laughs> uh, I, you gotta watch that spine, man. I remember. Yeah, I remember. I was rolling with you, man, and uh, I was like, "Please, finish me." <laughs> and this. I think you actually said that. I did. I think did I? Yeah, because I was. I'm one of those smash guys. I don't like to. Uh, sometimes if I can't get the submission right away or any type of choke or lock, whatever, I'll smother the person. Kind of like what Gordon Ryan does now. I did something similar in the past, and I was much heavier when we used to roll. I'm like 228 now, but when you and I used to roll, I sometimes walk at 265. So. Oh, that explains a lot. Because yeah. I, I was going to win. Yeah. I was going to win. I was like, I'm going to give him a chance, give him an opportunity. Yeah. And uh, but then, I regret it. Yeah, but then, you know, the, the steroids kicked in, and all of a sudden, it's so like, no. <laughs> steroids, huh? People thought I was on steroids for years, and I was like, no, I'm just... I grew up on a farm. I'm strong. It is what it is. Oh, so you used to do the hard working, the mm, hard labor. I was, I was a laborer. I used to, um, I used to do like a lot of, um, like I used to work the land basically. Basically, used to cut grass, I uproot trees, whatever they needed. I can pretty much do on the farm, or even on just basic land, clearing land, get trash off land, trees, whatever. All right. So, for everybody that doesn't know you, uh, mm -hmm. just that you guys know, Mr. Devon, you are a uh, Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Yes, sir. First degree under the Moncayo brothers. Got the goosebumps already. Oh, yeah. And you were in the military as well, right? Yes, I was from 2000, April 2004 to January 2009. I was in the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy? Mm -hmm. Cool, man. It was my dream. I wish I could. And um, when did you start training? Um, I started training officially um, February 2011. I started late February 2011. It's actually a funny story how I got there. How did you get there, brother? Tell us. Um, I had just got out the military, and it was a recessionary thing. I had moved from California to South Carolina, then South Carolina to Arizona. Then I moved from Arizona down to Florida, and I was like, um, I was like, I got to find my way or whatever. So I was living out of my truck. I was homeless. Okay. And... I worked at a little veteran thrift shop that was on Oakland Park Boulevard. And um, I was looking up a place where I, I could park my truck safely and get some sleep or whatever for the next day. So because I'm a dumbass, and, I'm sorry. Did you go to Walmart? There was <laughs> – no, that place is dangerous. I almost got robbed there once. So that's a crazy story within itself. Cool. But um, uh, usually I like to sleep in hospital um, parking lots. They're usually a little bit safer at the time. Okay. Um, I went the wrong way because I'm a dumbass and I forget. <laughs> I don't know directions very well. I'm still bad directions. I went the wrong way and I looked to my left because I, I guess I was heading east towards the beach. Okay. 
And um, I look to my left, and there's a team Popovich. That's Pablo Popovich's old school. Oh, cool, yeah, yeah. And it, I think it was like around December, it was right before Christmas. And I'm looking and I'm watching at the time. I didn't know who he was at the time, but that's Fred Munkayo. And he was teaching, I think, um, I can't remember what day it was. It must have been like a Thursday or a Friday. But he was teaching the um, no gi version. And his brother was also teaching. I didn't know him at the time. So I watched him like a weirdo in the window. They probably thought I was some weird homeless guy, and I was. Was he already a black belt at the time? or um, Fred was a brown belt, okay. and Jay already was a black belt, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I think Jay was born a black belt, right? He might have been. <laughs> Still kicks my ass, to be honest. Really? Caught me in a heel hook the other day. Oh, yeah. shit. Him and Ruben. Ruben caught me in a heel hook today, twice. <laughs> <laughs> Ruben okay. Alvarez. But, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I remember December. I walked in, I think, the next day, and I asked him what the prices were, how much I needed and everything, because I didn't have much money at the time. Um, so then he told me the price and everything. It took me about two months to save it up, because I wasn't – it was like maybe $500. I think it's like an initial fee plus, you know, however much you have to pay for that month. Yeah. So it took me – a long, little bit time to save it up and everything, and then um, I started officially late February. I can't remember the exact date, but it was late February 2011. Okay, and um, you trained at the uh, Pablo Popovich gym, right? Yeah, I trained there from that 2011 all the way up until right middle of 2013. That's when the gym started to shut down because um, of Pablo's Popovich. He had some issues he was going through. Oh really? Yeah, he um. There, hmm? there, there was a story. He he had to leave the country, right? He was gonna teach somebody else in another country. Is that true or? Well, the true story is um. I love you, Pablo, but I'm gonna tell everybody. Kind of knows it, but basically, he um. He was. He's. I think I'm not sure if they're still married now, but he was married to another woman, Fabiana, and um. And then he had a friend, Tiago Silva, his MMA fighter. Oh, please don't tell me he's the guy. Yeah, that's the guy. Oh, you see where this story Jesus is kind of going. Christ. So yeah. Tiago uh, Silva used to be married to a woman named Tice. I might be butchering her name. It's Tice Silva. Okay. Um, so. For people that don't know, Tiago Silva, he's a, he was a UFC fighter. Uh, do you remember the weight class? I can't he remember. was a heavyweight. Heavyweight, right? Yeah, good striker, heavyweight. Big dude. Yeah. I want to I wanna bring him over here. Yeah, well. I actually ran into him not too long ago, so um, he's definitely going to come through if you you know talk to him. Cool. So, and then what happened? Um, so, Pablo was basically having an affair with Tysa Silva. And um, wasn't, like, it wasn't my business. I didn't really care much about it or whatever. That's between them so that's what like i said i wouldn't even brought it up if it didn't get out but basically what ended up happening was um tiago found out about it the rumor was that he showed up to the gym and he had a gun um tiago silva yeah but um the real story from what i was told because i have a friend he doesn't lie about shit he's dead for it he he's said just, he's so, just like me he yeah doesn't lie. basically he doesn't lie about shit. yeah <laughs> he basically said that uh, Ti uh tiago's friend actually walked in asked pablo to come out i guess tiago probably was pissed off or whatever he walked out um pablo and him exchanged words and he came back in they went in the office <clears throat> A lot of people are like, well, he came in there waving a gun, but that's not true. Tiago did not go in there, from my knowledge, and just wave a gun around. Um, then, of course, I heard the story, and I didn't know that. I don't know what happened after that, but basically, I heard SWAT team went over there. They arrested him and stuff like that, and there's a lot of stuff. And then videos started coming out. I guess they were trying to ruin his name, Tiago, which ended up doing just that. He um, ended up losing his career for the with the UFC. But there was a lot. There's a lot to that story. Um, a lot of people don't want to really dig into and look into. But that's basically how it happened. And what happened? What happened to him, uh, Pablo? He 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 left Pop, the gym. Yeah. So what up happened was um, it, it's kind of funny. He was kind of shutting himself down in a sense. So he had Jay and Fred there. <clears throat> Jay, for those that don't know, Jay, he's the one who gave my black belt. He's um, he's, he's he competed, but he's not known for his competition. He's known for his teaching. He's a very, very good um, grappler, very good, good teacher. Fred is more the competitive side. He does MMA and stuff like that, and then he also did more like a lot of tournaments also. But um, they were running the school basically. Okay. They taught the school. They taught the jujitsu and stuff like that. That's what they were known for. Matter of fact, I didn't even meet Pablo until I think six months after. Okay. They were running the school. I figured it was theirs. But anyways, um, <clears throat> they ended up leaving. 
there was a dispute. I'll let them tell you. If you ever bring them on, they will tell you the story. But there was some sort of dispute. Yep. They end up leaving, and they started their own venture, which became successful. And they run a school now. They were in Boca, and then they moved to uh, Pablo's old school, where he, I think he originally started on, on Commercial Boulevard. Yeah. That's where I used to, tra- I used to train in Boca. Yeah, with yeah. Them. That's where I started. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's where they started Ventures, and they moved down here, and then things got a lot better for them. And then, um, but, yeah, that being said, they brought in a guy named A.J. Souza, um, really good grappler. He, um, I think he won Worlds at Brown Belt, and he's, like, really good. I don't think he teaches or trains anymore. Or he trains probably still, but um, he's a fireman now. Really good grappler, though. One of the best I've seen. But anyways, after that happened, the gym just started to fall apart because they heard about Pablo's thing, and then other th- stories started coming up, rumors, stuff like that. Mistakes that were made, things that could have been fixed, but um, the long story short to that is that the gym ended up shutting down. And it now it's still, the I think, the shop now is a hair, sh- hair shop. It's yeah. just sad. <laughs> just sad, yeah. yeah the other so, gym became a church. Uh, Mokayo's <clears throat> gym, the first gym from Boca Raton, it became a church. I yeah. You, and then I think they already closed down already again. I mm. don't know what happened to the place. If, let's just say that um, Pablo and Tiago fought, who do you think would win? Probably Tiago. Now, Pablo has really good jiu-jitsu, but it's different when you're getting punched in the face and by a heavyweight. <laughs> I've been hit once by Thiago. Are you guys the same good. size? Um, not um, Thiago Silva. Yeah. yeah. No, no, we're not. We're in the same weight class technically, but right now he's probably a little bit bigger than I am. I'm when I'm heavier. I'm usually I'm around his size. I'm, I walk it around two sixty five. I'm like two thirty today. Okay. But I've been training a lot more. When I when I just eat whatever I want, I go to two hundred and ten pounds. That's the. That's actually pretty solid for you. You think so? Yeah. Right now I'm 195. You're 195. How yeah. tall are you? I'm 6'2". 6'2". Yeah, no, nah, that's solid for you. I mean, you're good shape now, but, like, yeah, you can cut down. And you can also bulk up. It's up to you. From from the time we trained before, I gained a lot of weight, right? You can tell, right? A little bit more, yeah. yeah. But I was heavier, and then I got lighter, now you're heavier. <laughs> <laughs> fat ass. <laughs> I'm getting fat now, man. You know. <laughs> a little bit. But I, I injured myself. That's why I haven't trained in a while. So yeah, I I just got back and then you know and the business is taking my time. So yeah, I understand. Now, You're doing well, as a you never have you ever done MMA? No, I've never done you, MMA. You don't like I, it? It's not that I didn't like it. It's um I got in a little late. I thought about it at one point, but then I just kind of fell in love with jujitsu and you know me serving in the military at the time. Before then, I was like I'm tired of getting. I was getting shot at. I had to deal with other things. I was going through what I was going through in Cuba and stuff, and I had to. I've been hit upside the head multiple times. I'm, like, I'm good. I don't want to. <laughs> when you when you joined the military, you're already a, a jiu-jitsu fighter, or that was before it. No, no, no. Um, I didn't start jiu-jitsu until 2011, but I, but I didn't, I didn't even know what it was until it was ironic. Um, I went out to. Um, we were in Japan. This is 2008, and the first two MMA fighters that I met were. Um, Rich Franklin and Tim Sylvia, they flew out to our ship. And that was the first time we even had any understanding of what MMA was. Because, like I said, I grew up on a farm. I didn't know any of that stuff. I knew people boxed. I knew people wrestled. I didn't know people did, like, ground and pound, elbows through the eye sockets, you know, weird stuff like that. Do you think the the military training helped you to yes. become a better jiu-jitsu fighter? Absolutely, yeah. Um, Plus the farm work and everything. Yeah, physical strength. Like, a lot of people know that. You know, strength is king. That's why I always tell people if strength what didn't matter and all the other stuff didn't matter, there wouldn't be so many guys on steroids, you know. Oh, it does matter. It strength matters. So it doesn't matter if it's strong or not. It does. It doesn't matter when you are you don't know how to use it. Then Yeah, I always tell people strength is technique and technique is strength. Like um, the reason I advanced so quickly, a lot of people don't know this, but I actually got my black belt just over five years. So I got my black belt officially in October 2016 from Jay Munkao. Or Joao, Joao Moncayo. Um, yeah, For those who don't know, Joao Moncayo. Yeah, Joao Moncayo. I call One him of the most J. powerful black belts I've ever seen in my life. He, uh, All their black belts, we used to go to the gym. Mm-hmm. He used to make him tap out every single one of them. Mm-hmm. And, like, I was like, man, this guy. And he's, he? Yeah, he's, I mean, he's in great shape, but he's not super big. I mean, outside of tattoos, he's not tough looking and everything. But, like, he's a good guy. He's got very good grappling. He's very, very strong. 
And is Fred still fighting or? Um, Fred, um, I'm not sure if he's still fighting. He still trains as if he's going to, so maybe he'll fight in the future. I know he had a, he was dealing with some injuries, but. He, he was on a winning streak, right? Uh, he wasn't winning. I think he lost his last fight, but he was on a winning streak for quite a bit. He was known for that grappling when he was fighting for, um, I want to say Titan. I can't remember what he was fighting for. They used to fight, um, they used to have the promotion at uh, Hard Knocks or 365 off of, um. Uh, what Cypress Creek, I think it was. And when was the when did you meet Miles Gilbert? Was it the same time? <laughs> yeah, I met Miles. <laughs> I met Miles Gilbert. Um, not not too long after I started training, he was a purple belt at the time. Yeah, and, that's where I met him as well. Yeah, I just remember this guy. I mean, he wasn't super big, but he was a bruiser, man. He did not care who what size you were, anything. He will fight you, and he doesn't care. Um, that was when he started doing his MMA and stuff. I know he was amateur at the time, and um, I, I I I thought he would go a little bit further. He's doing well now, though. He um, runs his own gym. He uh, has a um, un Unchained, right? I think yeah, that's Unchained. Yeah, him and his um, his lady, his partner, they run a um, gym out there. Yeah, uh, I also invited him over here, mm -hmm. but um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. And, but, yeah. And John he, and uh, Fred Mokayo, I know I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I'm going to invite him over here because I have a lot of story to tell. Oh, yeah. And um, I told some friends that you were coming over. They're very curious about your military life and your, oh, yeah. your training life. And um, I told them you're a super soldier. And you, told, <laughs> you know, uh, you're by yourself. The, the U.S. Army, they, uh, the U.S. Navy, they send you by yourself. Yeah, a devil yeah, will take care of it. You can just go by yourself. Yeah, I attacked a whole bunch of terrorists, 200 of them, with a butcher knife, and I won. I'm just kidding. Oh, shit. <laughs> Rambo time, huh? Yeah, no. Nah, I, um, I joined the uh, – I went to a military academy. I originally wanted to go to college. I was going to try to go pro in basketball, and I was doing pretty well at first. Okay. Um, then I eventually got cut. I started having issues in school, um, you know, little things like that. So I ended up going to a little military academy called Wulugri Opportunity School. Um, not too long after I got there, base house there in 2003, but they they invaded Iraq. But before then, I think it was 2001, I didn't think of the military until the Twin Towers were hit in okay. September. Um, Back in September, I think it was 11. I can't remember. September the date. 11th. Yeah. yeah, September 11th. That's how far back it goes. Yeah. But long story short, yeah, that happened. And then um, two years after that, I went to the military academy and then I ended up where I didn't want to go in the beginning. I was originally supposed to become a Marine because I used to do a lot of um, marksmanship drum drills and stuff like that. I would go to competition and I would win sometimes. Um, They saw that. They started recruiting. They were looking for people like that. And my parents did not want me to go to war, so they sent me to the United States Navy. So I officially got into the Navy 2004, April. But you eventually you did go to war, right? I did. Um, I went to in 2005. Well, in 2004, I went on my first deployment, not to the desert, but we went to um, we went what we call them like a like a regular sea cruise or, or Mediterranean cruise. That's where you go to visit like Europe, Africa, um, Middle East. We spent a lot of time in Bahrain, um, Dubai, Jabali, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but then I went through some, what we call, they have what they call an individual augmentation known as IA in the military. And I signed up for that. And I ended up getting sent. I can't get into a lot of the crazy details because of the nature of it. But I went. I ended up going to like some of the countries or some of the places over in there, Iraq and stuff like that, the Middle East, stuff like that. I spent like not quite six, not even six months there. It was a nightmare for me. Um, my specialty was detainee operations. I can't remember the exact term they would use for the army, but I, because I trained with the army, they gave me an army like um. The, the term for it. but anyway basically I, just, I dealt with detainees and stuff like that but I also understood rapid response so my job was if let's say someone invades whatever if we were invade the camps or whatever my job was to you know deal with that threat and it happened and, and it happened um multiple times um but when you're over there for the most part it's boring like a lot of people think when you go over there you're always in common it's not true it's boring as shit There's nothing to do, or you got jobs in there? Um, they have a pretty decent MWR program. At the time, they didn't, but they had a pretty decent MWR program. Um, like you can, they they have movie nights and stuff like that. Um, of course, I had my I had an Xbox, but not like I got to really play it. 
<laughs> I was always busy doing whatever. I was on watch or some damn thing. Um, then a bunch of crazy shit happened there, and then I end up. Let's just say that, um, like, I think you're a very strong-minded guy because you saw <laughs> many things in there that, um, mm -hmm. you know, many people lose their minds. Yeah. <clears throat> and you think a strong-minded person, or you just, or you you deal with, you think about it. You do you have any? Uh, do you think you have any emotional damage from what you saw? Absolutely. Um. So. Quick fact, actually, um, a lot of people don't realize Pete. Um, so I've suffered what we people would know as a uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, and that can come from any type of trauma. Rather, you in war, you um, sexually assaulted, you've been in a physical altercation, you survive a car wreck, natural disaster, whatever the case may be. I dealt with that before I went in the military. The military made it worse. Um, usually, people with the most severe symptoms of PTSD, they tend to and I didn't notice till I read a book on it because I wanted to understand what I was going through that's what helped me get through it but anyways um if you had a trauma traumatic childhood um the military more than likely will make it worse and that's why the suicide rate is so high because a lot of those guys had those issues also the divorce rate <clears throat> right is also high oh well. yeah dude I'm, I'm lucky I almost became that statistic but I was engaged I came back to her being married <laughs> What the hell, really? Dude, it's a crazy story. And before I go back to the other thing, crazy story. So my, my ex fiance, she knows who she is. She, I hope she's watching, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, um, I I got called on deployment um, back in 2008. And she was, uh, she was a drinker. She was a Navajo, Native American. And she, you know, started... She, I've, I've heard she was sleeping around. I didn't think much of it. I was like, whatever, it's the Navy. Uh -huh. But um, we got engaged, so I figured that would change. So I bought her this 5000 uh, You thought it could fix her, huh? Yeah, I thought I could turn a hoe into a housewife. Yeah, yeah, classic rap song, right? Yeah. I was a super beta. But <laughs> 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 so... This like so I was like I ain't here for her. at one point I didn't hear from her I was already out on deployment we were already four months into this eight month deployment I didn't hear anything from her so we were getting ready to head to what we call Chinhei Korea and um uh, South Korea so she finally emailed and said yeah I'm sorry but I end up um, having sex with Chris as a guy's name and um him and I are getting married. Oh, and I found beautiful. out, dude, it was bad. I found out she pawned that five thousand dollar ring as a down payment for the house. Oh. She was driving around fucking this nigga in my truck. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh man, I was so mad. I, ended up, I, I sold that truck. I was sold like, the truck because of that. They're fucking in my truck. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, dude, I became, I, I literally became a statistic. I said, Jody, done to, uh, those are in the military. Jody is the guy that's sleeping with your girl when you're on deployment. So if you're on deployment, trust me. Have you heard about the story of the uh, the guy? He was a Marine, I think. Mm -hmm. And then he was deployed. And then mm -hmm. his girlfriend, she went from the, it was like an airport for mm -hmm. the military. And she went straight up from the place. She she went straight to the uh, to the porn movie setting. Uh -huh. And she, she did porn. Oh. With the same clothing and everything. And then they were comparing the photos and everything. When he came back, he oh. found out his girl was, was doing porn. Oh. I don't know if you heard about this story. I can send you the link for it. Yeah, send me a link for it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure I might have heard. I just got to be refreshed because I've heard so many stories. It's dude. a sad story, man. It's crazy. Imagine. It's a very common thing for, like, especially the military. We lose women all the time. And some of the women over there are losing guys. Because, like I said, um, we used to have a phrase in the Navy because we were on different piers. Yeah, pier one, pier two, pier three, and so on and so forth. And we would say fives, wives, or fours, whores. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, man. Dude, it was rough, man. Military military life can really mess you up if you don't. Like, it's a lot of good stuff. I had a lot of fun. And I'll get back to the other thing in hand. But we have a lot of fun. But there's a lot of times where it's like, man, we're, yeah, dude, you get screwed up really bad. When you join, When you join the military, <clears throat> You have that in mind that you're going to take a life. You might take a life. You might not do anything. You might not kill anybody. Yeah. But when you do, do you think that'll that'll haunt you forever or uh yeah, it's like a what's the best way I can describe it? I'll give you an analogy. So the first time I went hunting, I went hunting and we were hunting, I think uh, I was actually looking for rabbit. But the first thing I come across is giant squirrel. I'm from South Carolina, for those who don't know. 
And um, we I grew up on basically 22 acres of land. During the winter months and the school months, I'd be in the city. But during the summer and parts of the fall and some parts of the spring, I'd be in Ellery, South Carolina. It's like the lowlands of South Carolina. And um, I remember the first time I shot this animal. It's bleeding out. It's, it's a living, breathing creature. You know, I remember how I felt that. It was similar to when you actually take a person's life. But it's different when you take a person's life in a sense. It's like um. Like they can communicate with you and people like it's not like in the movies where you shoot somebody once or twice and they die sometimes you shoot them multiple times and it they take so fucking long to die man it's like they're making these noises you remember the smells because my what triggers me is actually so i like i said i have ptsd and what triggers me are smells <clears throat> like i remember i know like um this is gonna sound really graphic so forgive me I know what organ, some organs smell like, like weird stuff like that. Like I know what blood smells like. I know what burning bone smells like. It smells like hair for those that don't know. Like yeah. I couldn't eat steak for a long time because like that's what like flesh smells like to me when it's burning. Like weird stuff like that. So you remember that stuff and it'll stay with you forever. And one of the issues, not just with me, but I also, I also have a good friend of mine who he actually was there during the initial invasion and like he um he remembers a face he remembers how they were torn apart he remembers everything they used to joke about it we would post videos and pictures back when facebook you can post anything on there yeah and like um as time goes by you get out and you start to grow into yourself you become more mature you realize what you did and you're like what the fuck did i just do and that's what that's what haunts you do you regret um regret going into military yeah it's, some days I could say yes, some days I could say no. I don't regret overall because it gave me a lot of the necessary skills to deal with a lot of like issues in life. You know, my resilience went up because I had to deal with a lot of stuff. Um, my um, I I have a worldly knowledge. I don't I, want, I don't know everything. I'm 36. I don't know much of anything, but. I understand why some people, some cultures, or the way they are. I've got to see the world. I've eaten different food, banged different women from different countries. You know, I got to talk to different people. You know, and they're they're constant. Like for example, you speak both multiple languages. I can only speak one. You speak multiple languages. You can think in both languages. It gives you a whole different intelligence, a whole different thing. And that's what the military kind of gave me in a sense. Not in the language barrier, but like when you when you're there, you went to Iraq, right? I went to uh, what we call Bajra. Okay, and <clears throat> how are people there? Are they? They're actually quite nice. Really, they're not afraid of you. They okay, are. Sorry, we're we're invading. They're, like if someone came here, soldiers can be nice all they want, but we have weapons. We're backed by one of the most powerful, actually the most powerful naval, um, like navy in history. Okay. And, yeah. And, and um, when you're when you're there. Do they treat you nice or with respect or they just? Some people will and some people are just agitated that we're there. Um, usually the problems that we had over there. And like I said, I wasn't over there long. But the problems that we ever had there were like um, they just didn't want us there. Sometimes they pick up arms against us and stuff. Um, Do you agree with the war? No, I didn't agree with it to begin with. Um, it was... Put like this, they said that we were attacked by this country, and it was very clear that they there that wasn't the country that attacked us. We knew that, but when we attack countries, you gotta understand how America works. When we attack a country, we are usually looking for resources. We there's something there that like that they have that we want. Do you think it was oil? It was definitely oil, and if and, and like I've never been to Afghanistan, but we have guys that have been to Afghanistan. They're growing poppy fields. That's like pharmaceuticals and stuff. Like the pharmaceutical companies, that's what they need for their opiates and stuff like that, the medicines and stuff like that. And you know, we used to be friends with the Afghans, man, back in the day, and now we're over there killing them. And but that's a war we couldn't really win because they beat the Russians. They beat everybody that come there to try to invade. They've beaten back. And why do you think they beat everybody? Hmm? Why do you think they beat everybody? Do you think that's because of the terrain or they understand the land better? They understand the terrain. Um, they use guerrilla tactics. They're very unorthodox in the way they fight. Um, they're very good at intel collection. They were trained by us, so they understand our ways. They understand um, um, a lot of them are actually educated, which leads to Cuba. So 
I was a block guard and we used to call it Gitmo, but it's Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So we would capture guys and we'd send them to these different camps. Some people go to Abu Ghraib, wherever. I was a block guard in Gitmo. And um, a lot of those guys that we would capture, there were a lot of them that didn't understand how to write their language. They can speak their language partially, but they couldn't write their language, couldn't read their language, whatever. But then there was some of those guys there. Dude, there was guys there that had doctor's degrees. Oh, man. Some of them were martial artists. Some of them went to school at Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Some of them went to school in, like, Britain. Like, some of the best schools, like, the I forget the name of the um, college over in Britain. It's a very famous university over there. Been around longer than the Aztec Empire. They've been going there. Like, they're super literate. They can speak ten languages. Like, like these guys are, those guys are dangerous. Did you lose people that were close to you? Um, I lost a few, yeah. And some one when I was there, one when I left uh, years later. I think he ended up going to Afghanistan. And I found out two years ago that he committed suicide. And when people get captured, let's just say that you're there, and then you see that you're going to get captured and stuff like that. What would you do in that situation? Would you mm. let's just say that you're surrounded? You know, mm. there's no way out. Would you fight to the last bullet, or because you know they might capture you, they might keep you, or what, you know, for a while, torture you to get information? What would um, you do? I don't know. Um, it's hard to. I would just off myself. Man. I, <laughs> uh, I definitely wouldn't off myself. I would want to survive, um, but I'm not sure what I would do. I back in the day, I'm like, man, I'll fight to the last bullet and everything and stuff like that. And then I realized, like, as I get older, I'm like, man, I wouldn't be here. You won't, you want to go not because sometimes like they'll attack you and they're not there to they're not there to capture you they don't need intel that's they're there to kill you they set off bombs because they couldn't beat us outright the same thing in Vietnam they weren't gonna beat us outright they knew that they would use gorilla titus use all these traps but we were coming out we were killing them in force and that's when the frogmen made their days they were killing hundreds of men like one Navy SEAL go down 400 guys go with them they didn't care. Like they, they knew that, so they're like, okay, well, we're going to beat them in other ways, and a lot of people don't realize how that works. They knew that we filmed them killing us, raiding our villages, raping our – because war does that to you. Like it turns into – and not my full experience, but I've seen guys go over there, and they change completely, man. They turn into monsters. It turns like – I'll give you a quick concept. Like, And you'll probably hear this from other veterans. They'll tell you this. Like, you'll get – let's say you overseas. Let's say you're in Afghanistan. You do a little spurt over there for six, four or six months. And you go over there and you're you're killing people. Like the last person you kill, you kill a guy a week ago, and then now you're at home and you're hugging and kissing your family. And I'm like, dude, like for example, you and I went to war, I watched you kill somebody. I watched you stomp their head and blow their damn heart through their chest. And now you're over there kissing and hugging your wife. Y'all go out to Wendy's, get something to eat. Cause that's what I did. I'm like, damn, what I just did a week ago, I just murdered somebody and then I'm back home. Eating. But do you see that as a murder? Yeah, murder's murder, dude. Um, it's legalized. We could do it on mass. We can use bombs. We usually start with bombs and bullets, take out communication towers, whatever. We shut the country down. We bomb it right back to the Stone Age. We burn your books. We kill your martyrs, whatever, and hide their bodies. What we did with Osama bin Laden, basically. Like weird stuff like that. Do you, do you think he's dead, Osama? They say he's dead. I haven't seen any proof otherwise. But then again, it might turn into another situation like with the Hitler thing. Yeah. Hitler just simply disappeared. He simply they, even, disappeared. they even said um, he went to Brazil. He went or, to actually Argentina. Yeah. He died in the 50s or 60s or something like that. At least that was the rumor. You yeah. understand what I mean. And um, right now, about the uh, the war going on with the Ukraine, do you think the United States might get involved with this? I hope not. I hear so much about it. The only way we're already involved, but we're we're more of a support. Well, we, we're not fighting. I mean, no. We're trying to de. Well, there's a reason why the war started. The long story short to it is, the Ukraine wanted to join NATO. If, if I don't think originally they wanted to, but eventually, like, well, there's a lot of perks and benefits. They wanted to be their own country, and then um, and I don't know the full history, so someone's gonna correct me on that. But the problem is. Let's put it this way. If let's say Russia was good with Mexico and then they started building silos, they doing RATO, which is Russian whatever treaty organization. And then they start building nukes on our doorstep. We want to do something about it. 
Uh-huh. That's the thing with NATO. We'll give you all these benefits. You get all this and a third. But then we can bring our silos there. Those are the things that hold the missiles in place. Those are nukes. You know, Russia doesn't want that. So, yeah, they had no They, In my opinion, if I was in their position, I would have invaded Ukraine, too. Really? Yeah. I don't want them. Look, look I don't want I don't want your nukes on my doorstep. I can't even get to you. And Russia, like, Russia's got his issues, and, like, I do. I don't know much about the history, so I'm not going to sit there and presume that I know. But, like, with Russia, man, like, like we've been going at it for so long, man. We got we got all these we got all these issues with them, but they, like they we don't need to build more nukes on their doorstep, man. They're scared. Like we we starve them out. We seventy percent of their like resources basically come from other countries and shit. They're in a large the tundra desert over there. You know, it's it's a uh, dude. It's a nightmare over there. And then all of a sudden now we're building nukes on them. And uh, do you think Ukraine will go back to be the same thing it was before, or do you think it's gone? War changes countries like that, man. It might go back. Um, see what happened to Germany and all these other countries. They eventually made it back to where they need to be, and they're doing fine. Same thing with Japan. Japan took the worst of the brunt from us. So the main reason why Russian the Russians attacked uh, Ukraine, so that was because the whole NATO situation. There's more to it. Like they want kind of Ukraine to kind of fall. Like same thing with Georgia back when they attacked Georgia back in the. The 2010s, I can't remember exactly the day, but they want them to kind of fall back under their banner. Because remember, they lost territory, like after a lot of the wars they had to fight and stuff. If Russia goes to war in the United States right now, mm-hmm. at the current year right now, do you think um, they have a chance of beating the United States? No, not even close. Primarily because of our budget. Uh, so I, a lot of people don't realize, like, we're getting soft. A lot of people will say we're getting soft and everything. We're a very powerful nation when it comes, especially the most powerful naval, uh, country with the most powerful navy used to be, the, they usually are the most powerful in general. We have a very, very powerful navy. Like, the next 20 countries combined can't even match our carrier strength. Yeah, I, I saw a video on YouTube. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And um, this guy, he makes videos about war and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. He, he does simulations. It's a Russian guy, right? I yeah. His name. I, I watch yeah. his videos all the time. He, uh, the only way that um, uh, United States could be beaten is if everybody combined their forces and there's a chance they might do something about it, all right? Yeah, they might dent us, but they were, the yeah, most they'll do still, is take our territory. Yeah. Like, our outward territory, not the United States in general. And he did a simulation. What would happen if... The whole Europe was against us, United States, Brazil, mm-hmm. Mexico, everybody combined, you know, the Americas mm-hmm. combined against them, and still. It would be a hard time. Y'all would, like, I think it would be almost like a still, like, a lot of people don't realize, like, um, it's also about land mass. U.S., the United States is massive. A lot of gaps in between. And then we're covered by different nations. You'd have to come through Canada. And they got to fight their forces. Now, if they decide, hey, we're going to fight, then they have to come They got to come down to get us and everything. And then we also have the most of the guns in the world are owned by civilians here, and there's a lot of militias here, and a lot of them are actually trained. They're not a bunch of country rednecks that are sitting in the back of the woods. These guys, they're, they're ex-military, they're veterans, and they're looking for that. So there's simply no chance right now? I mean, no, nah, there's other ways they can bomb us, they can nuke us and everything, but then we can unleash our shit, too. We have a very large stockpile, too, plus our Navy. One destroyer can destroy half a continent. One. We have a lot of destroyers. We have a lot of cruisers. We have a lot of frigates, DDXs, whatever new ships we got now. How is life in the, on the ship? Because you told me before you were in the ship for a long time, right? Yeah, I was on a um, naval vessel, yeah. So how is life there? Is it boring or you got a lot, a lot to do? No, it's not a lot to do. So I was on what we call a guided missile destroyer. So I was on two ships. One was um, when I was stationed in Virginia, the Norfolk NOV. I was stationed on a ship called the um, USS Oscar Austin. It was named after a Marine that died in um, Vietnam back in the day. They named it after him. He had um, got the, the um, Medal of Honor. So they'll tend to name ships. After. But anyways, it's um, about 515-foot ship. Okay. Usually manned between 300 to 400 people, maybe 500 on a good day. Um, it's very cramped because I'm 6'7". It's very cramped. No women. No, there's women. 
Matter of fact, my first ship, half of the women, no, half of the people on the ship were women. Um, a lot of women in the Navy. A lot of people don't realize. <laughs> There's a lot can, of fucked up women in the Navy. Can, can you hook up with them in there? Or? Um, you're not supposed to, but it does happen, um, especially on a the ship. They try to keep that to a minimum because um, – like there's a structure, there's a power structure, and like so we have like ranking systems. So we have the E1 to E3, um, that goes well E1 to E9 actually. That'd be enlisted, but once you get to like E1 to E3, can only date each other, but not even on the ship day it's discouraged. But E1 to E3 usually they'll hook up, E4 to E6 can hook up, and then so on and so forth. And I can't remember the exact policy on it, but that's usually how it went. And then you had your officers, that's your ensign, all the way up to your admirals and stuff. Admirals are never on the ship. The, Highest rank you'll see on the ship is usually a full bird captain. Okay. Um, so it's rare that um, I mean it happened. Actually, I'm sorry. It happened all the time. People hook up all the time. They fucking each other on the ship and stuff. If you get caught getting pregnant, then that causes issues for you, and you can get busted down if an officer sleeps down with a. Um, Do you get punished for it? Yes, you can. Ooh yeah. The kicked out and stuff like that. Or? Um, usually more severe than that. You'd almost want to get kicked out. We used to call it the full chicken dinner, oh, or the big chicken dinner, as you call it. You get 45, 45, 40 di- that's 45 days restriction, 45 days half pay. Limited, um, you get um, heavy duty, so you get to work all day, every day, with little pay, which you're not making much anything, much of anything in the military. The pay is different now, but you're still not making as much as you should be, in my opinion, for what we do. Um, and if you die, your family is... It's going to be taken care of, right? Yeah, so when I was coming up, they had what we call the SGLI. Um, it's like an insurance policy. You promised $400,000 to your family. Taxed, of course. <laughs> oh, Jesus, really? Yeah. Um, when you, if you get like a pension or a check or whatnot, some of that can go to your family, but not always guaranteed. And what happens if you, um, is there a line when you go there and you're shooting each other? Is there a line where you can't cross? Like, you mean like a barrier or something? I mean, all right, I shot that woman there because I thought she was a terrorist. Oh, I see what you're saying. Is there a line or you, can, you can't cross or you can just kill whatever so, you think is a threat? Um, so you have your RREs. Not, so you have your rules of engagement, and those would change all the time. Like I said, I wasn't there very long, but I would hear the stories – like once I even left that um and even when I was there they had like oh, I can't remember the the one where they almost had to fire at you first from certain distance and everything like that because there was a lot of um misfires. What a lot about of, children? Um, hmm, children, same thing. They get they get the bullets too because um it because dude, children are some of the most dangerous things you'll see in those situations, man. Because you don't know if they're. That's what they're being raised to do. You know, I've seen it when I've I've seen them when I've gone near Africa. I've seen it in different countries. I've seen it in like even here. We have militia groups here to train their children, and they're dangerous, man. So yeah, they're gonna get caught up too. Women too, and they used to, they used to use the children, and the women, and it happens almost everywhere. They use them to carry their bombs and stuff. They'll have them walk in the shops where it's full of soldiers, sailors, Air Force, whatever, and they'll just blow them up. And then you. Have you ever seen children being killed and stuff like that? Or Yeah, I've seen children killed, and unfortunately. That, that's going to hit you like a, like a double um, It makes you look at children differently, for sure. I have two children myself. Um, and um, sometimes I look back. I have a seven-year-old son. And some, I, I, I couldn't imagine. I started working when I was a year older than him. I was, um, I would work, like, and these kids are going through worse than that. I thought I was bad. And I was like, my son's got a nice man. He's like, he's got a phone. He can call me. He lives with his mother. He's got a phone. I have a, I have a daughter that's going to turn two, man. He, she lives a good life. They have a beautiful family. She's going to be taken care of. When If I die and my grandparents, or her grandparents, my my in-laws die, my mother, those children, all of our children, they're going to be damn near millionaires. They're going to be taken care of. Yeah, well- you yeah, have a these son, kids, right? Yeah, I have a son. But these, I'm telling you, these, these kids over there, man, they're going through it. Africa is the worst. Oh, yeah. I heard about it. Yeah, like some parts. Not all parts, but some parts. Worse. Now, if, you, uh, if your son tells you, hey, Dad, I want to I join the military, what would you do? Would you let him go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the reason I say that is because I cannot – I can train – I can teach him and tell him all my experiences and stories, but it's his life to experience. I don't want anything to happen to him. Man, if something happened to him, I'd be very upset. But I cannot stop him from doing what he wants to do. It's almost better that I let him make his own decision. Maybe he sways himself away from it. 
based on my experiences. And what do you think about women in the military? Do you think they should join the military? I'm fine with them joining the military. I don't think it's a good idea that they get put on the front lines. It does it happen? It does. Um, not all the time, but it does happen. Um, not even just on the front lines in general, like women, like even as police officers. I, I, there are a lot of good police officers that are women and everything. They have their place. But let's to be real, like um, I don't want to serve with them in general. Like in a com, if I was overseas, I would not serve. I don't want to because they can't carry me. Um, they can't keep up with my stride. You gotta think I'm six foot seven athlete, you know. And even the athletic woman, she's not gonna be able to carry me. She's not gonna keep up with me, you know. She's carrying all this weight, then she gotta carry me if I go down. Um, they can't get more hits on targets than the men do. They get more injuries. Um, they also become infertile. They can get they can mess up their bodies quicker, like their hips. Usually that's the biggest thing I see here from women are hips and stuff like that. Now don't don't get me wrong, like they are capable of a lot of things. But there's a reason why they like they had these uh these women they did a story on it. They had they they, they almost hated that they did it, but basically they put them um these women in through one of the hardest schools you can go through is for Rangers, I believe it is, in the Army. And um, they had the women, they, the women, they said the women passed, they were the first to do it. But when you look back at the story, man, they walked them through it. They failed multiple times. And even when they let them through and they said they passed, they actually failed that course too. And like, Shit. yeah, man, like there's a reason why they can't make it through the Navy SEALs. Even if the Navy SEALs lowered their standards even a little bit, they still couldn't make it through. They sent a woman there, and she watched. And a lot of guys. And the thing is, a lot of guys. I would watch. I, I thought. I, I thought about becoming a Navy SEAL, but then I remember going through the swim course because I in boot camp they have you do like the SEAL challenge and stuff. And I'm like, man, I'm not a good swimmer. I'll get my ass kicked out. So I decided not to do it. Oh shit, man! I would have washed out in a cup, but women they wash out much quicker. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I have good news and bad news. What is that? The good news is you got to come back because <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Yeah. The bad news is uh, we got to go. Oh, uh, I'm sorry if I talk you out of death. No, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Because, I uh, know, some people, they don't, like, you You talk and express yourself really well, mm -hmm. which I think it, uh, it's just perfect. But um, it's just so much we got to talk about, man. Yeah, and, um I don't. I don't keep it longer than one hour. I understand. You know, people lose their focus. Oh, it's been that long already. Yeah. See. Oh. I know. It's my company. It's, I love this. Man. Yeah. Opa answered all your questions and stuff. You did, but I got more, and uh, oh, yeah, you gotta you gotta come back because we we have a lot to talk about. I got some friends from the from the military. They're mm -hmm. gonna watch this. Yeah, yeah. And it's gonna be fun, and they're gonna ask a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to bring another guy here. He's from. Uh, he he was a uh, he was a marine, mm -hmm. and I wanna. I'm gonna bring him over here as well. Maybe both of you guys can come because he's a he's a 100% American. He's a very very nice guy. Yeah, yeah. And he saw things. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying with those Marines. Um, that they see some great like Marines Army. I love Army too. Army, I have the most respect for. Not because I don't like the Marines or anything, but like the Army. Those guys, I grew up around them, and they go through it. So, but the Marines, man, they got some crazy stories. Those guys are different breed. I know. Yeah, I know. He he is different. You're gonna you're gonna notice him. Oh He's, yeah, yeah. Now we have a tradition here at Torian Podcast, which is oh yeah. Uh, you gotta try one of these gloves and tell people what you think about them, because you know these are prototypes. We uh, try to make the the best glove in the whole world. So okay, put them on. See how they feel like. If they don't feel good, tell me about it. Just don't be afraid. Just tell me like yeah, I don't like this shit, bro. Your your shit is. It's, it's terrible, bro. Well, I actually kind of like the design here. I like this strap here. Yeah, this it makes strap. it much easier because I'm not one that don't want to tie. Oh, no, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like tying. So then you got to find someone else to do it. It's like, come on, man. God damn it. <laughs> just tie the goddamn thing. And then they tie it wrong. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> See, if it's good, I have big hands. Uh, yeah, I can't tell. Look, they look. Oh, shit. Yeah, I got massive hands. <clears throat> well, I'm a true big black guy. <laughs> <laughs> how, how tall are you? I'm 6'7". You're six seven. Yeah, my dimensions are weird, man. I'm six foot seven. I wear a size I sixteen shoe, and my hands are massive. You're you're taller <laughs> than than John Jones, right? A little bit, yeah. So I got John Jones, I think, by three inches. 
Have you ever seen him in person? Not in person, no. You want me, you want me to help you? You want me yeah, to do the exactly thing you told, just told me about? <laughs> no, yeah, right? <laughs> no, so I no, actually have a funny story about John Jones. I'll be quick. Um, I trained Tiago Santos. Well, not trained, but I was his sparring partner. I was, trained, I was John Jones, basically. So that oh, was fun. shit. Yeah, he almost won that fight. I think he won that fight, to be honest. It's just he blew his name. Tiago, yeah, he was here. He Ooh, came here. hard. I kind of want these now. Punch the shit out of somebody. Yeah. What type of leather? This this right, real leather? Real cow leather. Real. Oh, shit. I've cow? seen the cow getting killed. You saw the cow? No, what I was, a little, I, shit I was a little dramatic. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> you sick fuck. You I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you right, dude, Listen, I used to, but, we used to butcher cows. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> these actually, I like these. These, are, uh, these must be 14s. Yep. These are, yeah, these are 14s. 14 ounces. So those are real cow leather. Um, I like this. Color. 100% genuine leather. Mm-hmm. And um, um, I work for a guy. I don't work for him. He's my client. But he's uh, he hired a professional. He does, he he works with leather, only leather. And yeah. I, I showed him my gloves. Can you tell me? Can you mm-hmm. take a look? And he said, well, it's true leather. It's high quality leather. Yeah. So they last for a long time. Yeah, they feel good. Well, do right. It's good because like I got a big old mass of hands. You do? Yeah. So. Look, they look different on me. Look at that. Yeah. They feel good on me. Yeah, look at the same. See. About the same, almost the same height. I got you about five inches. <laughs> well, so you approve them, right? You think they're cool? Yeah, I actually like them. You like them? Comfortable inside? Yeah. Can you break someone's face with it? More than likely. The, I'm not the best striker, but I'm pretty sure if I catch them on the ground with these, they're done. We got to spar again because I'm pretty sure I'm, I got much better, man. I don't know. I, I, am, I improve also. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Just because I say I can't strike, I'm not the best striker, but my ground and pound is vicious. Yeah. Yeah, dude. All right, people. So uh, thank you so much for, for coming. And uh, leave a like. Subscribe to the channel, Torian Podcast on YouTube. Uh, follow us on Instagram, uh, Tori MMA. I'm sorry, my a lot of a lot of monsters and Red Bulls. And uh, thank you so much for being here. I want to thank everybody that um, gave support to the brand, which is I want to thank my mom, uh, Vanusa, my dad, Nivaldo. I want to thank um, uh, Susan Glacy Marine. She's a judo black belt. She's a very Ooh, nice fighter. That's scary. She just won a, a tournament. And uh, 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 Marciana Paiva, thank you so much. Studio, the TLC Studios, thank you so much and um, making everything possible. And um, thank you all the clients, everybody that buy our gloves. Thank you so much. You, you, all you, if you, um, if you, um, what I was gonna say, I gotta stop drinking Monster and Red Bull, man. It's messing up my yes. brain because I don't sleep much. Get but, a Celsius. <laughs> no, really? Really? Yeah. Is it better? Probably. It <laughs> tastes better to me. It tastes better. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you guys. You have any final words for the for the people watching? Join the military, bro. Yeah, join the military. It'll be fun. <laughs> Just so you know, it'll be fun. Join up. <laughs> Talk to me. You could be like me. <laughs> yeah, you could be like me. I only sleep under my bed um every now and again. <laughs> join the military, man. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much, and I'll see you guys soon. I hope so.